Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our JCI forum on Chinese high-speed rails in Southeast Asia. So high-speed rails, uh, for anyone who has been to China lately, uh, has uh, grown tremendously in that country. Uh, they've got some 35,000 kilometers of high-speed rail in China uh, since it began to modernize some 20 years ago, accounting for two-thirds of all the high-speed rail around the world. In Malaysia, uh, high-speed rail uh, is manifested in uh, a project called the East Coast Rail Link, uh, or ECRL in short. Uh, this particular project has got a lot of potential. Uh, it strategically connects the less developed states in the west co uh, east coast of Malaysia uh, to the more developed states in the uh, west coast, uh, and potentially allows cargo to flow through Peninsular Malaysia without going through Singapore. However, it comes at a significant cost. Under the previous administration, this project was estimated to cost 65 billion ringgit. And even after renegotiation, it is now expected to cost about 45 billion ringgit, by far the largest infrastructure development in this country. So because of the huge public interest uh, and public significance in these huge infrastructure projects. Uh, it is uh, perhaps very important for us as citizens to understand uh, its details and its implication. Uh, we have therefore very uh, honored and fortunate to have Dr. Guani Lim from uh, the National Technology uh, University in Singapore uh, to come and share with us his research in this area. Uh, Dr. Lim is an expert on Chinese and Southeast Asian affairs, uh, so he will share with us his latest studies uh, in this area on high-speed rails, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a political perspective. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. Lim to the podium. Please welcome Dr. Lim. Good afternoon. Thank you for making time for this event. And thank you too for the very generous introduction. Uh, yes, I, I believe this is a topic that Malaysians or non-Malaysians are interested in, uh, in the sense that uh, it's like a very expensive toy, right? I mean, you buy it, what do you do with it, right? Who pays for it? How much are you gonna pay for it? How are you gonna stretch it? Do you pay it upfront first or, you know, stagger? Then you know, ask for a haircut later on. The Argentina approach, I call it the Argentina approach. So, um, you know, I threw in Indonesia because the third offer is uh, Mirza. I haven't seen him for a few months, but uh, yeah, he's, he's doing his uh, PhD in Canberra now. Uh, you know, he, he comes into the Indonesia part. Uh, Lee Chen is an old friend, so we thought that we'd come in with something interesting. Uh, comparative politics. Our goal is to submit a decent paper to world development. And after writing it about 80, 85% up, we realized that chances are there's 85% of chance of us getting rejected. So, you know, uh, we were quite prepared for it. But having said that, you know, I think this will form an interesting story, right? For the next two hours, you know, I, you know, I, I think you at least be entertained by it, right? <laughs> if anything. So, yeah. We organize it in this way because we only know how to organize it in one way, right? In a technical paper format. So we start with uh, main argument, why Gao Tie means HSR, and we look at the two projects, the overview, uh, how they have uh, been sold to the public, right? I mean, Najib sold it in a certain way, uh, Jokowi sold it in another way, uh, Mahate Mohammad sold it in another way. Uh, then the theoretical framework, maybe I don't spend too much time of it because I don't think you know, most of you here wouldn't be too interested in that. Uh, and a bit of background, Malaysia and Indonesia, and that we are actually cousins, you know. We're actually cousins, just that we evolve very differently, right? Just like Singaporeans, are my, our cousins, are, but they evolve very differently too. And the results, discussion, and conclusion, what does it mean for us, you know, taxpayers? Uh, yeah. So, okay, uh, the main argument is this, local politics matter, right? I mean, you know, 
you open up a newspaper, you know, you look at Xi Jinping's face, right? And you know, he, he has plans, right? He has plans. But really, what really matters is not so much his plan, it's more about Marte versus Najib, right? <laughs> to, to me, that's, that's my argument, and I'll show it in a while. And we use two cases, ECRL, our ECRL, and the Jakarta Bandung HSR, DIAS. And if you look at how we push those projects, right, um, we do it a lot faster than the Indonesians. And our argument is because we have power centralization. It has happened uh, under Mahate 1.0, continues to Mahate 2.0, right? Whether you got Anwar 1.0 is another thing, but it has been like that. It has been like that. And that helps you to push projects. Rightly or wrongly, it helps, right? Indonesia, oh my gosh, different. Uh. Power is dispersed, two levels. Jakarta to province within cabinet, right? So when you have fissure, division of, you know, labor that goes so much out of control, right? Projects, they don't get implemented. Or if they get implemented, you know, you get people you know, just blocking you for the sake of it. And we'll see it in the Indonesian case. So why Gautier, right? Because uh, it's, it's been the talk of, of the town for a very long period. And for the BRI, you know, they have this thing called the five connectivity, Wu Tong. You know, if you look at that book by Xi Jinping, you know Xi Jinping actually published one book, right? That book has his face on it, right? You can buy it. Uh, you know, there's five things that he mentioned. One of them is Ming Xing Xiang Tong, heart to heart, right? It doesn't translate very well to English, right? And one of the vehicles is Gao Tie, HSR. And it's good because you promote linkages, trade, investment, so on and so forth. And it also helps China because uh, ever since the last, I think, 10 years or so, the Chinese economy has restructured. And with restructuring, businesses go a bit slower. You know, consolidation, simply put, right? Uh, we can talk a bit more about that later on. You know, if you're not interested in Gautier, we can talk about that, you know. So uh, this was the first term, uh, the Najib term map, right? Not the Mahathir term map. I purposely put it here. And the reason why I put it here is because, um, okay, okay, because you, you get this estimation cost, travel time, you can reduce the travel time, but the cost will increase by a bit. That was the promise sold to us. Although, you know, I tried to check Malaysian logistic executive government officials, I never found them, you know. I never found them, right? So whether you believe in this figure or not is another thing, but I never found them. Yeah. It's like my imaginary friend. Anyway, this is what it is. Uh, it gives China assess across the Straits of Malacca, right? The choke point. So that gives you, that land bridge gives you space, geostrategic space. Again, if you believe in those kind of things. Lah. And uh, it also bypasses a bit of our Singaporean friends. Lah. A bit, lah. a bit, lah. not a lot, few billion dollars, right? Estimation. Okay. Um, the reasoning is simple, right? You connect the east coast to the west coast, poor, rich, average out the growth, lah, right? Uh, funny because uh, that's what the British said many hundred years ago. Uh, the gap has still remained, if not, it has worsened. And you know the, the same argument getting flogged. You know more connectivity is good law, right? That's the same argument. Uh, the value, uh, this is a bit funny because uh, both Mahate and Najib, they had very different sums, but I'm using Najib's sum. Uh, 55 billion, uh, I translate it to about 20 billion, right? Uh, exchange rate fluctuate a bit, so I fix it as such. 600 kilometer project, which was later renegotiated. And if you remember, at one point, uh, Malaysia was very concerned about middle income trap, right? You would know that. Right, uh, Najib Razak built his political career on beating the middle income trap until he got into trouble. Uh, you know, he got into some issues, which we all know uh, it's ongoing. I can't comment too much. And you know, that's what happened a long time ago. You want that last push, that last mile, right, 
to get you past the middle income trap. And CCCC is the main con, 85% of the construction costs comes from the Chinese side. And it was uh, politicized uh, between the two PMs, uh, Mahate threatened to cancel or renegotiate. And you know, uh, whether you believe this led to regime collapse, I leave it up to you. But this was one of the issues being played out those days, right? Uh, some other issues include forest city. If you're from Johor, you hear about it, right? Uh, Banda Malaysia as well. <laughs> and uh, you know, Mahathir's new admin uh, cancelled the ECIL, I think in three months. He was in Beijing and basically uh, the press conference wasn't happy, right? Uh, you could see both sides weren't very happy. The thing got cancelled before getting revived later on. So uh, I don't have to tell you this. Okay, Indonesians. Jakarta to Bandung. A lot smaller than Malaysians. But same logic, right? We connect this to that, you know, we move goods and people. Boom, economic growth law. At least that's how it should happen uh, on paper. The sum is a lot less, uh, six, about six billion, uh, 150 kilometers mega project, which is about one fourth of ours. And Jokowi, um, when he came to power, he projected this image as, um, you know, a commoner, right? And in truth, he is, you know, because he's not linked to all the oligarchs. But he did very clearly promise the Indonesians that, hey, um, I'm going to give you good infrastructure. That's his promise. And this, this is very important to him. And he's had invested so much effort into it. But we're interested in seeing how it plays out. So CRCC this time, the main con, 75% uh, of money comes from CDB. Uh, the Indonesians uh, come chip in with their own money uh, through four SOEs. Uh, they call it BUMN in Indonesia. Uh, in Malaysia, we don't have an equivalent ministry. The closest to it is uh, ASMIN's uh, MEA. La. But you can argue that the MEA is uh, reincarnation of EPU. Right? Theirs is solely SOE. Right? Cousins. Ma. And it was uh, battleground between Mr. Jokowi and Prabowo Subianto. Uh, he's currently defense minister, right? I mean, he, he, I think he tried to run for president twice. Twice he lost. Twice he became a sore loser. But this time he became defense minister, right? So he was very clearly angling towards a Mahate approach. He even said that, yeah, we want to do a Mahate here. That's what he explicitly stated, right? Um, but it was not to be for him. Uh, the regime actually survived. Uh, they won. May 2019, uh, but Prabowo made it very difficult, right? He, he just kept complaining and whining and stuff like that. And Jokowi, in his second term, is pushing for it, right? After reshuffling all the people who were against him. I'll explain it a bit later. Jokowi on the left, Prabowo on the right, right? The guy on the right lost. So this is the overview. Uh, Length-wise, we are longer. Of course, we renegotiated a bit, right? Uh, Cost-wise, we cost a lot more. Business model initially it was just built, right? Under Najib Era, it was built. Under current admin, it's built, operate, and transfer, right? So superficially, you got a better deal, right? Indonesia always got built, operate, transfer law. So we are moving closer to the Indonesian model. Contractor uh, CCCC versus CRCC and friends. So that's the superficial surface kind of uh, difference. Lah and similarities. Theoretical framework, we took this from Sinia 2005. Uh, she, published, she published a work on Indian federalism. Why do certain states like Gujarat grow faster than other states, right? So we, we took a framework, uh, adapted it, uh, give it a bit more spin, give it a bit more arrows, and we think that this can go, you know, can be published. So basically our argument is this. Um, we split elites into two levels, local level elites, provincial elites, and central elites, right? So in the Malaysian context, central elites are, you know, Mahathir law, Anwar Ibrahim law. State elites are like uh, the old version of Lim Guan Eng, right? State elites. Uh, central institutions are like your Ministry of Finance, EPU slash MEA. State institutions are like, uh, I don't want to say this, don't get in trouble. <laughs> there are some state institutions like, uh, say, PKNS, lah, right, in Selengo. Uh, you have PKNS, uh, PDC in Penang. 
So they have competition and collaboration at all levels, at all times. And we are interested in seeing how they create outcomes. Not all outcomes are good, nah. a lot of them are very bad. And that, that's where we think we can beat Senior 2005. Because Senior does not look at two factors. She does not look too much at political contestations, number one, and contextual factors. And she doesn't look at contestation within central state structure. She was only looking at federal versus state, right? And for the first one, um, I'm not saying that Sinia is a bit naive, la, but her assumption was that people do this for economic gains. I'm doing this to drive GDP. I'm doing this to make sure that poverty level reduces, right? Uh, in reality, it's not really like that. La. There are a lot of non-economic considerations, which we'll see later on. You'll probably know some of it. And there's also a need to cater to contestation within the central structures. Um, you know, I'll say this again, I always say this, um, in fact we just said it during lunchtime, was that uh, if you look at East Asia, Suharto, the Suharto years, basically it's between 1960s to 1990, right? Indonesia grew very quickly, right? Malaysia, Mate first term, grew very quickly until 97. Korea, right? Park Chung Hira grew very quickly. Taiwan, you know, Jiang Jing Guo, Jiang Jie Si Yira grew very quickly too, right? They all had one commonality. There was centralized command, right? One guy talked, everyone listened, right? Uh, in Indonesia, it, talk, it took the form of Berkeley Mafia. No, of them went to Berkeley, la, right? Some went to Vanderbilt and so on and so forth. But basically, it's a bunch of economists, American trained, highly technocratic. Um, they were the right left-hand man of Suharto. They were in charge of in agencies like Bapinas, Bank Indonesia, right? These were technocrats, who for the most part are very determined. Lah. Mahathir's first era, if you remember it well, um, was very cohesive. Uh, you know, you had EPU, which listened to the Prime Minister, uh, and towards the last leg of his career, he became MOF too. You know, let's not blame Najib for taking both MOF and PMO because Bad Badawi did that. <laughs> Badawi totally did that, right? Where did Bad Badawi learn it from? From Mate, la, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you look at EPU, EPU was supposed to spend money, right? MOF was supposed to not make you spend money, right? So, you know, if you remember what Mat Sabu said many years ago, uh, Najib goes to Najib and asks for money, la, and Najib says yes to Najib, right? Mahathir did that, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, what I'm trying to say here is uh, when you are developing, you need to reduce coordination costs. And oftentimes, it means a centralized command at the apex of the government, right? Korea, no need to say, right? Korea is probably the most extreme form of it. So go back to here. We, can, we believe we can, uh, we can uh, add some flash to here and here and we will have a hypothesis hypothesized outcome here right being more coordination means more project implementation very simple argument right so uh, but we had a fissure in 1997 many of you here will probably remember what happened during 1997 i was very young i was a schoolboy but what happened change our course permanently, right? Indonesia became uh, very, very messy, very, very democratic. It came at the cost of uh, regime change. Uh, economic performance was poor for many years. I was okay, la. you can save the economics, but institution-wise, not too great. The point is, we combated the crisis by doubling down. Uh. We were very centralized, but we doubled down on centralization. You know, we, a deputy prime minister was famously sacked. Um, yes, and a lot of power got clawed back because at the time, that deputy prime minister was holding MOF, right? It was temporarily transferred to another former MOF before he went back to the PM, right? You know the names, I don't have to tell you that. Indonesia, uh, no, there was Kabupaten. Everyone wanted to be a provincial chief, you know, 
that's how it happened lah. Indonesia, if you look at Suharto, Habibi, Gaster, that's how it evolved. Uh, central elites, uh, for Malaysia, you are more and more beholden to one person, right? Indonesia, no, you don't have to be, because uh, Habibi had no clout or influence like his predecessor, lah. And you know, Megawati and all those they just became worse and worse. The overall outcome for us, uh, rightly or wrongly, we have elite cohesion at two levels, right? Um, the EPU became very strong. The PMO became very strong. At one point, we had 10 ministers in the PMO or something like that, right? Which is, I don't know why, but there's a lot of ministers. Uh, now, uh, a bit less, but still a lot. Um, Indonesia, uh, elite conflict, you have uh, the BUMN minister uh, supporting the president. And you have the Ministry of Transport, right? Uh, Jonan. Jonan famously say, no, no, I don't want to show up for the ribbon cutting. And that's what happened in Indonesia. You can say no to the president, right? You can embarrass him. Right? That's what happened in Indonesia. And the expected outcome of this is, uh, in economics we call EV, expected value, is that Malaysia, with all these things, project will move ahead. At least we think it will move ahead. Uh, for Indonesia, no, it will be delayed or even cancelled. Right? So this is how we see the Malaysian uh, situation. Um, you know, I go by the most powerful officers of this country. La. PM, MOF, they have same goals because they were the same people la, for a very long time. Uh, Minister EP was beholden to the first guy, <laughs> so he had similar goals. La, right? uh, the chief ministers at that time had similar goals too. Uh, Selangor was a bit lukewarm, but overall was not too against it. Lah. I think Selangor had 18 kilometers of land you know, stretching through Gombak, right? So, uh, not much you can do lah, if you want to object, right? And you know, the ideology was similar lah. But um, opposition led by Mahathir Mohamad was, you know, a bit different lah. It was potentially injurious to national health, financial health. So we have to renegotiate or totally cancel it, right? And if you look at the PM and the, the, the old PM and the old MOF, uh, there was some element of rent seeking, alleged rent seeking, because uh, you, you're not guilty until you're proven so, uh, right? You're not guilty until you're proven so. And, uh, you know, the project cuts across rural heartlands, which is very important if you're a politician, right? These are very, very important places to secure your votes. Indonesia, you can tell it's a lot more complicated, right? It, it's so, so complicated that it's so hard to explain. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that the president, he didn't have a lot of backers, right? He only had a uh, minister of SOE behind him at that time. Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the name? I can't remember. Anyway, she's been, shuff, she, she's been shuffled out. Uh, so basically, they had similar interests, the Minister of SOE and the President. Minister of Transportation, uh, Junan. Junan famously didn't agree with that. Uh, you know, you can just Google Junan Ignatius and you see what he says. Embarrassing the President at a very critical ceremony too. Um, the Indonesian military, uh, I think many of us know that Indonesia had not a very proud history in the 60s. Uh, involving some alleged communist movement. Uh, a lot of people got killed. Uh, the power was transferred from Sukarno to Suharto. You can Google about it. And Suharto being a military elite, uh, they were very fearful of Indonesia getting too close to China, right? And that belief still stands today, right? I, I know it's silly, right? But people still believe that. And, you know, this project is seen as a vehicle to export communism, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense, like you know, but that's what they believe. And the West Java governor, uh, basically welcoming, um, because he's a Jokowi man, uh, but the person beneath him, the region, is mixed in the sense that yes, you can do this, but uh, give me X, Y, and Z. But the thing about the X, Y, and Z was not in the negotiation with the Chinese, right? The, the Chinese didn't. They didn't factor that with the deal with the Chinese. But he wanted it, right? And, and he said, if you don't give me, then I'll just do nothing, Lord. Then these people, these are my people, right? 
I know it happens in Malaysia, but not so common and not so brazen. No. And the opposition, led by Prabowo, um, basically it's a cheap and poor man version of uh, Mate, la, right? And uh, as expected, not much result. Lo. So, this is the discussion points. Um, the first category, Najib and Mate, they were both unchallenged. Uh. When Mate wanted to renegotiate, no one that I know of note stood up to him. Very little people stood up to him. Uh, but if you look at Indonesia, um, you know, you have Jokowi Sumano, Rini Sumano, uh, the former minister of SOE, and Kamil, the, the provincial governor, versus just one guy, Sutisna. Sutisna is just the region, and it, it took three guys from the central level to fight one small fry. You know, that's how bad it is. And Sutisna is not losing that much. La. <laughs> right, uh, you probably had to pay Sutisna off. But anyway, uh, the central elite side, uh, I, I don't think anyone objected too much when Mate recently took over from uh, Masli, right? Right? Nobody says no to Mate. Maybe City Hasma says no, la, but, but generally nobody says no to Mate. La, if you, you know, you should, you know. Um, and if you look at central elite ties in Indonesia, no, you definitely, definitely can say no to Jokowi. Military says no, uh, you're taking up part of my air base, right? Junan say, no, I prefer Japanese technology law, no, something like that. What can you do, right? Sack me? And he was sacked, eventually he was sacked, but that took too long. Uh, overall outcome is that it's very cohesive in Malaysia. Uh, again, you know, as a Malaysian, this may, may or may not be a good thing to you, right? But this elite cohesion, uh, Indonesia, elite conflict, two levels. Um, and as expected, Malaysia, we facilitate the projects, right? Whether you look at Bandar Malaysia, right? We can even stretch the example to Bandar Malaysia. It will still totally make sense, huh? right? The same factors will still have the same outcome, similar outcomes. Lah. Um, Indonesia project delay or even cancellation, right? That's just the way it is. Lah. So, uh, we go back to Sinia's argument, right? Um, basically, projects are not totally economic rational, you know, not logical economically. And Malaysia, some of the money was allegedly siphoned to pay for our good friend, you know. <laughs> Again, no evidence, so we can't comment too much. And it was very clear that uh, the former PM and the current PM, the East Coast states, there is a, they have been fighting you for so long as the federal government, right? How do you make them permanently your friends, or at least not fight you too much? In Malaysian politics, you make them see your way, lah. You give them big projects, lah, right? From fishermen to laborers, lah. I mean, we call that from rubber tappers to laborers, lah. That's a strategy, lah. Uh, it's a very naive strategy, but I think we do that very often. Um, this strategy went well with the respective Menteri Besar's, right? They went totally well with that, and. I don't think anyone in the state level would object to it. And, you know, Marte probably realizes it, uh, fights them for almost his entire career. So these are not totally economic arguments, right? These are more political arguments. Whether you're Bersatu, Amno, uh, this Amno Baru, right? Pass, the logic is still the same, right? So in Indonesia, uh, the strategy worked, la, you know, you, know you, you tie this Chinese project to your political career, it works. For, for Jokowi, it totally works, la, right? Is it totally economic rational? No, it's not. Right? It's probably going to lose money too. Uh, Prabowo uh, wasn't economically rational, but politically he was smart, right? He was trying to play up this fear of China-Chinese communism equals Indonesian-Chinese. In this country, we do that also, la, but, uh, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. La. Indonesians, they do that too, so we are not alone. Okay, the second level, uh, within the central level, um, we want someone at the central, at the apex, to control the dialogue, right? to minimize transaction costs, coordination costs. Uh, our highly centralized structure does this job very well. And, you know, whether it's Mahathir 1.0, Najib, Badawi, Mahathir 2.0, right? Still highly centralized, right? 
that one I don't have to talk too much about it. Lah. Indonesia very polarized. You have bureaucracy, infighting, a lot of coordination costs. Left hand don't talk to right hand, right? This leads to project delay and has been pushed back so many times, right? So the conclusion, you notice that this, this slide is exactly like the first slide. No? Because I want to emphasize the message that at the end, they, we don't really care about Xi Jinping. We care about what um, Lim Guan Ning is thinking, what uh, Jokowi is thinking, what Mahathir is thinking, and how it plays out, right? Because at the end, they, uh, all of us are Southeast Asian, most of us are Southeast Asian Malaysians, lah, right? Before the Chinese came, uh, there were the Japanese, right? And Dhaka, right? And before the Japanese came, there was the British, right? Remember the British trading houses, crown agencies, and you know, General Electric's US, we were playing with them, right? So what makes you think that we cannot play with the Chinese? If anything, the Chinese should be afraid of us. That's my message, lah. We've, we've been so used to playing with foreign money, right? Yeah, that's it, lah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lim. Uh, for uh, that very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, when you spoke about uh, centralization and how we have uh, Dr. Mahathir again, um, it came to my mind that uh, he has uh, become acting education minister. So perhaps uh, more centralization and perhaps if he asked for um, um, black shoes, he, and ask for permission, uh, the, the Prime Minister will say yes to, to this Acting uh, Education Minister. Um, so with that, um, perhaps I can invite our uh, public uh, guest uh, to uh, ask uh, some questions that you have in your, in your mind. Um, perhaps we can have um, three questions and we'll group them together and um, uh, pose it to Dr. Lim. So uh, any, any questions from the, from the guest? Just raise your hands. Uh, what happened is uh, based on the second bridge in Penang project, mm -hmm. the local economy does some benefit much. Mm -hmm. Because majority of the building materials, the labor, mm -hmm. the logistics, are all done by the main con mm -hmm. in China. So will the ECRL be the same s mm -hmm. situation? Why is he Thank you. So w one of the things you mentioned in the beginning was that one of the reasons was to circumvent Singapore as a harbor. Mm -hmm. And you know what's realistic there? You know what what is going to be transported from where to where mm -hmm. uh, through this railroad? I think you said about centralization and decentralization. Yeah, uh, Malaysian Indonesian context. Uh, Indonesia's case is the IMF intervention. Mm -hmm. They may have decided the Suharto era is over mm -hmm. and decentralization mm -hmm. and chaos. Uh, we had centralization because Mahathir was strong at that mm -hmm. point in time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have two different experiences. Mm -hmm. Just tagging on, if I may, <coughs> high speed in your context, mm -hmm. what is the speed that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Is it the same speed for ECRL and the Jakarta Bandung rail mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. Malaysians, are, we are a bit naive, uh, but, but that's not new, lah, right? Uh, we, we believe in this thing called trickle down, that if you have one big project, and you know you subcon to this guy that guy you know everyone wins lah right uh, in theory it works in reality it does not and it's not surprising that the Penang Second Bridge doesn't benefit the locals that much lah right but uh, how much is much it's a quite a technical argument lah, right because because if you look at how they compute uh, you know typical financial model um, I can't say I'm the best financial modeler but I can tweak the numbers quite well, right? So that part is quite technical and quite academic, but of course, uh, we normal people, we, we probably don't feel it. And you see that in downtown KL, we have a lot of projects that are super flashy, but I don't think they are very integrated to the local economies, right? Maybe to the fat cats of this country, yes. Right? I'm going to tell you who fat cat is, but, <laughs> but uh, that's a totally valid argument. But uh, as an economist, I can give you the number I want. <laughs> I, 
I can give you the number I want, uh, but it's very hard to prove. Lah. There are certain assumptions behind it. Uh, but as far as ECRL is concerned, uh, the reason why we don't know it that much is because um, you all still remember Liu Tiong Line, right? Our former Minister of Transport. Um, he promised to release the feasibility report uh, and he kept promising and he kept never giving until he was booted out of office, lah, right? And the current MOT, uh, the, the, the guy, what's his name? Look, right? Look, right? Um, Look hasn't given us that yet. And I don't think you'll be given that ever. <laughs> because I, I believe there's an OSA in this country, or what? Official Secrets Act, right? And I'm not sure how long the, the period is, but as long as we don't change that, all of this will be dominated by two groups of people, right? No, three groups of people. One, journalists. Two, people like me, right? Three, uh, the fishmonger, like the market that you see. So we don't have a definite answer to that, but uh, to Mahate's credit, he actually said we will have more local participation, we have uh, more Bumi participation, not just in the contracts lah, and you know, in all facets. That's the same for Bandar Malaysia. If you look at the official statements coming out from the MO, not MOF, P PMO, right? That's what they say lah, right? So yeah, that question can never be answered without good data. And good data cannot be taken because the authorities are not giving it to us. Right? Yeah. I, I, I don't know whether that answers your question. Actually, right, uh, the figure was a bit too optimistic uh, because currently there's a lot of indirect trade going on. Uh, the figure is like, I think, how many billion? I think 60 billion Malaysian ringgit. I, I actually I actually published that before. I had a figure, I published that, that before. Uh, it's in, um, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I will do now. Um, I have this paper published in Journal Contemporary China. The figures are all there, but I can't remember it now. Uh, if you're interested, Google my name, Journal Contemporary China. Click on it, if you can download it, because it's open access, so uh, the figures are there. But in, in practice, I don't think it works. People go to Singapore not because they have a flashy port. They have an integrated system. And we don't. The fact is, we think we do, but we don't really have it, right? And, and, and the fact that we have so many ports in this country. Port Klang, Malacca port supposedly, right? Malacca port, Pasir Gudang port, Johor port, Sarawak port, Sabah port. Port Dixon don't count. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we have too many ports and we don't have this coordination, right? And most of the ports are really, really very small, right? Very, very small and they do very niche markets, right? And, you know, even if you account for that land bridge thing, if you are a business executive, you, you simply don't do that, you know? You don't go to Port Klang, Tell the port clan guy, say, hey, I want to unload my cargo, you know. Port clan guy takes your cargo, puts it on the truck, goes all the way to Kuantan, then from Kuantan go all the way back to China. No one has done that, right? Be because the current economics does not allow us to do that. It does not promote that kind of things, right? And as a business executive, what do you want? Consistency, predictability minimal variation. So I don't think we can really steal that much business from Singapore. Uh, in fact, this question was asked in the Singapore Parliament a few years ago. A minister, Josephine Teo, um, she answered that, you know, this is the statistics. Uh, the Malaysians are not really going to steal business from us. Right? The, the Singaporeans answer it for themselves, right? The third question is centralization versus decentralization. Um, I don't think that IMF was that evil to destroy Indonesia. It was just a byproduct. I, you know, if you look at IMF people, they are really smart, like super, super smart people, right? If I can write number three on my Excel sheet, they can write 3,000, right? That's how good they are, right? But they never, in their hearts, wanted to destroy Indonesia. I don't think they wanted to, right? But the end product was that they did. It's a byproduct, right? And Mahate being Mahate, you know, uh, kind of got rid of his rival, uh, stopped the rot, so speaking. But uh, we can talk about Mahathir all day, but that's not a point. Uh, the next question was high-speed definition, isn't it? Um, 
I use high speed definition because they use high speed definition, right? And in reality, high speed, there are multiple definitions, and even the gauges, there are multiple definitions. I'm using this in a very layman, layman way, right? And I think the Mate version of HSR, ECRL, is very different from the Najib version. Mate one is a bit slower. Najib one is a bit faster. Yeah. Why I say that, sorry if I mean. <clears throat> Why I say that is because different high speeds have different costs. Oh, yeah. have very significant costs between 350 mm. and 160. Mm. So I think that's clear for you to define what's high speed. Mm. Mm. Thank you, sir, for that feedback. Uh, Dr. Lim, if mm. I may, take mm. this opportunity to uh, perhaps ask a few questions that are also on my mind. Mm. Um, first of all, I noticed in your presentation mm. that you mentioned that uh, one small uh, officer in Indonesia, mm. uh, a, a port official, mm. uh, Sutisna, yeah. uh, managed to uh, push back against mm. the, the president mm. and his superiors. Um, and I understand that he uh, managed to negotiate mm. some uh, benefits for the local mm. people on the ground. Mm. So uh, I'm just curious why in our case in Malaysia, um, uh, the ECRL went through Kelantan, which mm. was not part of the government, uh, went through Selangor. Why is it that our officials do not try to push back against the, the central officials to try to get better uh, benefits for the, for the local people? Mm -hmm. um, and, and second, I also recently read that China uh, has instructed their central committee mm -hmm. for uh, discipline in, uh, inspection mm -hmm. uh, to have officers in their BRI projects mm -hmm. to monitor against mm -hmm. corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your view about this? Sutisna managed to get his deal uh, for his people, so speaking. And we don't really see it in Malaysia because we are so centralized. Um, a good example, uh, I always have to pick on that state. Uh, okay, this state uh, in Malaysia uh, um, sells water to other state, right? I don't know. <laughs> sells water to other state, right? Um, but the federal state is not happy with this decision, tries to intervene. Uh, but that state, turns around and say, water is my purview. That's why we form a federation. And if you look at Malaysia, officially we're registered as Federation Malaysia or something like that, right? And you know, that state is not completely wrong, right? But federal state has their own objectives. Lah. And who do you listen to, right? That's, and, and over time, the federal state became stronger and stronger. And um, in that state, uh, there's this body called I, I, you will figure out the state already, but in that state, there's this uh, federal, there's this federal state body, which is a stat body, right? But that stat body has two chairmen. Uh. One is the Menteri Besar, one is the Prime Minister himself. But in all other regional corridors, only one chairman, uh, the PM. Right. You look at North Corridor and all those, the PM is the chairman, right? But in that state, in that region, got two chairmen, chairman, right? That state has some power, right? But the fact is we can claw back power from, you know, even the score in Sarawak, right? It listens to the PM, not the chief minister, right? That's how much power we have. As a local, you should know your master, right? Be being very practical, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, and the bre monitoring that that's quite new. That's quite new, a uh, bit hard to assess. But uh, you know, one thing that people tend to have this impression about China is that we fix China as the two thousand eight version of China, the the Olympic boom China, right? And you know we have this impression that hey Beijing is very foggy one. Right? Actually, it's no longer that foggy, right? And and the, the the biggest story here is that the Chinese change, they get smarter, they evolve like us, they learn, they become better, right? And and we have this impression that Bri is doing this, 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 but the reality is that Bri, the previous version was China going out, so Chu Chi, right? And over time, it became more streamlined, right? If you look at um, 
um, this BRF, the one that Mahate attended last year, May, after we successfully renegotiated uh, the forum, the Belt yeah, and Road the brief, Forum. The brief, uh, right? Um, if you look at the brief and before the brief, uh, um, the pre brief, uh, the Chinese investments they look very different. And you can say that it has become more tapered, more streamlined. In the past, Chinese companies were buying, you know, AMC. You know, AMC is, you know, many of you watch Walking Dead, right? There's this show called Walking Dead. Noah. Yeah, the zombie show, la, the guy who goes around and says, Carl, yeah, that guy. La. So, right, that company bought over AMC, right? And at the time, Chinese money was going all over the place, buying stuff. Some ended up in Forest City. And, <laughs> and, and the point is, the, the government stopped it, right? Imposed capital controls. And part of the reason was that money was flowing out so much that the Chinese became fearful. And when you put that, right, you get to streamline, reorganize. And people don't really give enough credit to the Chinese. La. They, they do learn a lot, right? And, and if, you, if you look at how the corporates evolve, huh, you, can, you can really see the, the state may not owe shares in you, huh, but the states can influence and sway you. All states can do that, but I think the Chinese state is, uh, is very good at it, in the sense that it's effective, but probably not very efficient. Uh, can I go on? Because that's my favorite topic. Let me go on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Two. Okay, okay. If, if you look at rich lists, uh, you know, Forbes top 10, Forbes top 20 or whatever, uh, you look at Malaysia, uh, always the same guy, Yo Tiong Lai, Yo Tiong Lai father, Yo Tiong Lai daughter, right? Lim Gotong, Lim, Lim Gotong son, uh, Said Mokta. Said Mokta himself, because he's not dead yet. Ma. And you know, the, the few guys, like, it's always the few guys, right? Same for Indonesia, uh, the Astras, la, right? They're all there. La. The fat cats, the oligarchs. Thailand, even worse, la, right? The, I don't want to make fun of people who are dead, ma, but uh, anyway. <laughs> um, the CP groups, right? The Bank of Bangkok people, right? The Sopopanish, the Lam Sans, right? All these fat cats, they're there, right? And they've always been there since the 60s, la, the 70s, la, the 90s. We look at China, they are not always the same person. In, in fact, I dare to say, <laughs> Jack Ma, in, in five years' time, he'll be out. He'll be out. You can record that, la, by the way. Be because if you look at the corporate history of China, the number one guy to number three guys, they always change. They always, always change. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I leave it up to you. Uh, to me, I think it's a great thing. Right? I, I cannot stand people richer than me. <laughs> That's me. But the, the, the reality is that when people say, oh, China is scary because, because, because they are not democratic and stuff like that, I think the answer is, my answer is not really that. You know, is that China, to some extent, is very democratic. Right? You know, the way they have organized themselves is quite democratic. But I think what they are trying to say is it does not have a bourgeois class, bourgeoisie, to check the state. It does not, right? Most Lib Dems, right, especially European versions, uh, you can check the state. The bourgeois make sure that the state don't have too much power. And there you have this whole democracy you know, system working. Uh, China, I don't think you can say that the bourgeois can check the state, la, right? I don't think so. La. So I think what people say, oh, China is not democratic, what they are saying is this, you don't have an independent bourgeoisie class. You may have a bourgeois, bourgeois, but they are not independent enough to check you, right? Of, of course, uh, you know, Malaysia can't comment too much, la, but, <laughs> but the reality is what they are really afraid of is that. And we don't give enough uh, credit to the Chinese, right? Dr. Lim, mm. if I get you correctly, uh, first point is that you attach a lot of importance of domestic politics mm. to this uh, train project. Mm. Yeah, but if you 
how do you see China, you know, in terms of the importance mm -hmm. uh, that they attach to these uh, speed, uh, I mean, high speed trains mm -hmm. to Indonesia and uh, Malaysia? One is because I think they put quite a huge amount of money, in mm -hmm. the case of Malaysia, 20 billion US dollar. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, China also building alternative, mm -hmm. one through some countries into China, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, the latest one, you know, they also building alternative in uh, Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you see that? So uh, you mentioned in your slides, mm. give examples of uh, federal and state relationships. Mm. Uh. You mentioned particularly three states uh, mm. through which the ERL is going to pass. Mm. There's uh, Pahang, Terengganu, and Kelantan. Mm. And somewhere there, I also noticed you said that Najib's idea is that uh, projects like this can capture the hearts and minds of the rural people, mm. and the, the voters can flock to Najib. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I remember when the project was first mooted, mm -hmm. you know, the situation was then you had BN ruling Pahang mm -hmm. and Terengganu, but PAS rule Kelantan. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 2018, PAS gained one more state, mm -hmm. and BN lost. Mm -hmm. But it's, until today, they still support. Uh. So uh, it cannot be that they support because Najib also supports, right? Because if Najib say, I, 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 I want to bring this all in to capture votes from you, and now, the new government uh -huh. in Terengganu and Kelantan, Kelantan is still the old government, uh -huh. and they are saying that, yeah, we agree, we agree to have this project, uh -huh. but it cannot be agreeing because of the same reason that Najib wants it. Mm -hmm. So what, what is, in, is it in it for pass in Kelantan and Terengganu mm -hmm. to agree to this ECRL? Mm -hmm. It cannot be for the reason that Najib says, I'm going to come and capture the votes from you, right? Hmm. So, so what is it? What is it that PAS agrees to it? I think Najib said, I'm going to capture the vote with you. <laughs> I think that's what he said. I yeah, mean, that, that is, uh, that is uh, maybe after 2018, uh, but yes. before uh, 2018? There's Mahathir saying. Mahathir is not going to go and say, hey, uh, Hadi Awang, I'm going to do this with you, right? He's not going to say that. But the, the point is, uh, most of the money will come from the Fed, lah, right? To Kelantan, you know they don't have money, right? Oh, oh, central government don't know how much money, I don't know. La. But the point is, it makes total, total sense for the Kelantan Menteri Besar to say yes to this project. And, and the dynamic is the same, whether it's Najib era or Mate era, right? And, and that's one of the reasons why Mate wanted it so much, right? Because Mate never had good relationship with all these guys. Huh? Never. Actually, it's very bad, right? But I don't want to second guess Mahathir, but the, the point is all of us in this country, or at least in this room, we want a lasting peace with the people in the East Coast, right? I don't want to be treated as an alien there. I am, but, but the, point is, the point is, this is it. This is a chance for us to make things right again. At least if you listen to the, you know, the economists, they will say stuff like that, right? And I think on that note, the interests align. And besides Kelantanese, they don't have money. The, the federal, the, the state government has no money, right? You can ask Lim Guan Ning, Lim Guan Ning will repeat the same statement, right? Yeah, but why isn't the royalty given to Kelantan? Uh, that's another issue. Huh? <laughs> that's another issue. Huh? Oil being extracted, gas being extracted from Kelantan for many years and they have never been paid the royalty. That goes back to centralization law? That goes back to centralization. So, of course, they are poor because the government doesn't want to give them the oil royalty. Takes the oil from them and gas from them, but doesn't want to pay them. That's all. It's a two-way thing, but let's not go into it, right? <laughs> we also have this question here on uh, high-speed rail in Myanmar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Chinese are not going to say that, Myanmar, you're not important to me. Mate, you're not my friend, right? They're not going to say that. And if you wear the cap of Xi Jinping, no, he doesn't wear a cap, but if you wear the hat of Xi Jinping for one day, right? And to me, uh, his equivalent would be Lloyd Blankfein, Goldman Sachs, right? And Goldman Sachs or Xi Jinping, right? He has many goals, right? A corporate CEO has many goals, many objectives, many GMs, right? I don't need all of you to succeed, right? In fact, all of you will fail. A lot of you will fail. I just need two success. Then I can turn over, right? 
that's how CEOs behave. That's how Xi Jinping should behave. And that's that's basically Xi's thought. Like, he's not going to tell you that, but if you think in a corporate way, then that's perfect. Not all projects will make money. In fact, most projects will lose money. I only need one success, or two. No need a lot. Life is like that, isn't it? So the success of this project depends on Xi Jinping or depends on domestic politics? Multiple factors. Multiple factors, but at the end, they, you know, I always say this, you know, the, the Chinese are a lot bigger than they think they are. I, I think the, the, the joke, the analogy was designed actually for the French. Right? I'm sorry if there's any French people here, but that was designed for the French. But if you contextualize it, put it in Asia, then the Chinese look a lot bigger than they, they think they are, people think they are. And that goes back to my pursuit over the last five years that Chinese money is actually so, so small, right? I mean, you know, they want to have statistics. Lah. I don't want to have statistics. You can Google Scholar me. You look at all the data, right? Chinese FDI is not out investing Japanese FDI. They cannot even out invest Southeast Asian investors in this part of the world, right? So they're not as big or scary, right? What's the chances? Mm -hmm of this project mm -hmm. being linked, not by mm -hmm. the local politics, mm -hmm. but by China itself. One, because you look at what happened in uh, mm -hmm. Prague. Mm, yeah, Prague. You know, we see what's happened. Uh -huh. The president uh, mm -hmm. refused mm -hmm. to go to Beijing. Mm -hmm. So you have seen you know, similar effect mm -hmm. in certain uh, South Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think probably there are more coming soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the chances of this project being delayed? I mean, well, you ultimately it will get implemented. Mm -hmm. I don't know, probably it will take another 20 years, 30 years. Mm -hmm. But what's the chances of being delayed? Because you have 75% uh, money coming from China, and we know China, they are very creative mm -hmm. with the financing methods. Mm -hmm. So what are the chances of that? The precise amount, I can't tell you that, nobody knows. Uh, uh, if you trust my financial model, then you know there's a number there, but, but usually it's not very accurate. Um, but it's a common thing, isn't it? I mean, projects get delayed, downsized, uh, given another name, isn't it? I mean, why, why so specific about the Chinese, right? Oh, no, 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 not about Chinese. I'm talking about these. No, these two, right? This one example. Well, the, the Indonesian one clearly has been delayed. It has clearly been delayed. That happened to uh, our Malaysia project. Oh, you delayed by eight months already, my renegotiated. Eight months already. That's because initiated by his uh, current government. Yeah, yeah. What makes you think that the next government will survive? The coming government will survive. I mean, these things happen, right? <laughs> these things happen, and we just have to live with it. And it goes back to our life, right? Our life is not perfect. <laughs> our life is pretty messed up. Then all the uh, political benefits uh, that you mentioned. Uh -huh. Oh, we, we don't know that. You know, some may have been siphoned elsewhere. We don't know that. But if you have to assign a problem mm -hmm. of this project being delayed, mm -hmm. what's the delayed? Delayed. Oh, delayed. Oh, very simple. Delayed. I think the chance is probably 80%. Uh. Delay, my right, can be delayed by one day, like one year. Delayed by a certain time. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one, the I can't answer that. La. But generally, they get delayed, la, right? So, generals change and all those. Right? Yeah. So, if I may. Yes, sir. Testing. Uh, Dr. Lim, mm. uh, one or two things here which I would like to ask. Uh, if we have traveled on the China HSR, mm. we know that the different trains will run at maybe 200 kilometers mm. per hour, 250. Mm -hmm. 300 and maybe the latest generation is 350 yeah, kilometers 50. per hour. Mm. For the ECRL, if I'm not mistaken, the design speed for passengers will mm. be 160 mm. kilometers per hour. And for freight, it will be 80 kilometers mm. per hour. Mm. So if that's the case, I think we may not be right in classifying that rail as the high speed rail. Mm. Mm. However, I think there's another railway there, which is the Kuala Lumpur Singapore mm -hmm. high speed rail, mm -hmm. which appears to be a lot more economically viable mm -hmm. and maybe you know quite uh, good for both cities. Mm. 
But that project is on hold, mm -hmm. and I think the negotiations are still going on. Mm -hmm. And I believe for that HSR Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, mm. the China Rail has not really got an exclusive uh, hold on this project because many other countries mm. are also submitting mm -hmm. their bids. Mm -hmm. So the question is this, uh, I don't know whether you be able to give us some background on mm -hmm. this other highway, mm -hmm. what would be the proposed design speed, yeah. and whether it is near to getting approval from mm -hmm. both governments mm -hmm. to be implemented mm -hmm. soon. Thank you, sir. Yeah, these two questions. Um, you know, the implication, I feel like the implication um, of your research is that more centralization allows us to implement projects faster. Mm. Uh, perhaps at a uh, bird's eye view, you, uh, I want to get your, elicit some response on uh, what this means for the type of governance mm. and government structure uh, we should be advocating for how, like, what is the level of centralization or decentralization you would recommend uh -huh. um, to balance out, uh, you know, making sure that development happens, but at the same time, uh, balanced against you know development as well. We know that Malaysian states have some certain Malaysian states have been uh, deforested. Or you don't you don't want like you know these train tracks to just bulldoze over mm. pristine rainforests that have been mm. actually reserved or gazetted and they just cover it. Mm. You know the top government just covers it over. So um, at some point we do want some sort of citizen veto. So where is your where do you think the balance lies? I, I didn't get that high quality questions in Beijing. I presented the same thing in Beijing before before Christmas, right? One or two days. Anyway. Um, I think your question uh, aligns with his question that uh, 160 km per hour is not really high. La, you know? uh, if you drive a Kanchil fast enough, you can reach that, la, right? <laughs> Do we still use Kanchil? No, right? I don't think so. La. Not a good idea. Anyway, um, look, the KL Singapore one, uh, again, there is no proper reports that are being presented la, for probably the same reasons because OSA uh, is still here right and we don't have much information on that what we do know is that uh, the person in charge is MEA uh, Minister Asmin so uh, it was delayed uh, we asked Singapore for an extension of three to five years I can't remember uh, I don't want to toot my horn again but I actually wrote that case study you can Google Scholar my name and Kuala Lumpur Singapore HSR you can find me there um, we paid X amount of money. I can't remember how many million we paid to Singapore, right? We, we paid them because we delayed it. Yeah, quite a lot of money. Uh. Um, so yeah, we broke the contract, we have to pay, law, right? And I think now we are trying to shift the dynamic, right? Singaporeans don't really object to it, uh, is that we have the RTS. Let's get the RTS done. And if we have the RTS, um, you know, things will perhaps be better, right? Something like that. And we can, you know, go up on a larger scale. That's the narrative being spun, right? And, you know, too high a speed may not be a good thing. Too high a speed. I, I never agreed with that because all of us, we live in Singapore, right? And Singaporeans get unhappy because we steal their jobs or something like that, right? That's going to happen anyway, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean that's uh, it's a tricky question. And I think the closest example was London and Paris. I think many years ago they built that and I think we can learn a lot from the London and Singapore experience, uh, London and Paris example. Uh, we are clearly not London in this case. Uh. We are clearly not London. Yeah, that's all we have to know. We're probably not even Paris. Uh. <laughs> okay, um, yes, uh, Jin, right? Jin. Jin, Jin, Jin. Uh, look, more centralization equals better implementation. At least in, in this context, yes. La, but uh, for every case of that, right, I can point out one very centralized country and say that it's a basket case, right? That's just it is, right? And you know, a quantitative researcher will say, no, you have to have many data sets. But I only have two data sets, right? So, so I'm, I'm comparing at a very relative level, but uh, 
I, I don't quite agree that more centralization equals to better implementation. Uh, but in this context, I do, right? For Malaysia and Singapore, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, yes, I totally agree with that. And the type of government stru governance structure to recommend, actually it depends, right? Um, I'm a deeply flawed person, right? I'm egoistic, I'm vain. So, you know, I don't want to <laughs> damage it even further by offering any policies. And it goes back down to, there is no one size fits all in this world, right? There's none. We, we, we cannot assume that the policy that works in Malaysia will work just as well in Papua New Guinea, right? Or Iran. We, we can't, and I can't do that. And having veto power is great, but how much of veto power is good, right? And is veto power even a good thing? It depends on the context, right? I mean, I mean, that's I. I don't have a strong answer to that. And um, but I believe, on a very technocratic level, the cut-off point is U.S. dollar seven thousand uh, PPP adjusted purchasing power parity. Uh, there is a very good research done by David Dollar. He's based in Brookings. Uh, he said that the turning point where you should stop behaving like old Korea, old Indonesia is 7,000 and but he was arguing in the context of China because you know uh, China seems to have this knack at least apparently it has this knack of growing very quickly despite not having good institutions right and David Dollar's argument was that yeah but that's because they are very near to the 7,000 inflection point when they cross this point um, Things will not work so well for the Chinese, right? That's David Dollar's argu argument, lah. Seven thousand, right? PPP are not nominal, la. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lim. Um, I um, am very uh, happy and uh, to to hear uh, the uh, uh, very important points that uh, Dr. Lim had shared. Uh, and in particular, it gave me the uh, sense that I, as a citizen of Malaysia, um, we can help to shape public uh, policy decisions. Uh, because the decisions are not solely uh, made by the elites, but uh, just like in the Indonesian case, if we are active citizens, we can help to influence our local representatives mm -hmm. um, to make the right decisions mm -hmm. uh, for, for ourselves and for the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with that, please join me to thank uh, Dr. Lim again for his insightful presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks.